back. I hope you are enjoying the play so far and I hope you're still staying happy and healthy. We're going to dive in today to Romeo and Juliet Act 3, Scene 5 through Act 4, Scene 4. So, quick review from last class. A lot of stuff happened here. After Romeo and Juliet get married, the action of the play moves very quickly. There's no time for breaths, for stops, and it's just action throughout the rest of the play. So what do we see last class? Well, after the wedding, this huge public brawl in the public square, a few things happen here. One, Mercutio killed by Tybalt, right? We really see the loyalty of Mercutio, but ultimately his downfall because he had his loyalty to Romeo and the Montagues. And then, out of vengeance, Romeo acts out and goes to Tybalt and slays Tybalt, his now cousin, because he's married to Juliet. The tensions are rising, and the consequence of this, of course, is that Romeo has now been banished from Verona. And we saw some very intense imagery about banishment and choosing Juliet over God himself because Juliet has become his God. We talked about all that last class. So, what, are we, what do we get now? Well... After Romeo and Juliet express their sadness individually over this banishment, right? Choosing, willing, wishing to die rather than be separated from one another. Friar Lawrence tells them, I'll figure out a plan. And for now, he's instructed Romeo to comfort his new bride. A lot of the language that we talked about was this mutual desire for one another to share in the marital bedchamber, we can call it. And so scene five opens up with this. This is the first and last night Romeo and Juliet spend together as a married couple. So please turn with me to act five or act three, scene five. We're going to start right here with the very opening of this scene. So just to set it, Romeo has once again snuck into Juliet's bedchamber where they have spent their night together and have consummated their marriage through sexual intercourse. What we're seeing now is Romeo, it's morning, it's the dawn is rising, and now Romeo has to leave Verona to Mantua, otherwise he will be killed. So, Juliet, sad that he is leaving, says, Wilt thou be gone? It is not yet near day. It was the nightingale and not the lark that pierced the fearful hollow of thine ear. Nightly she sings on yon pomegranate tree. Believe me, love, it was the nightingale. Okay, so here... Shakespeare is playing with a very large tradition of imagery, specifically the nightingale. Um, from medieval legends, the nightingale was the bird that sang songs between forbidden lovers. So he's putting Romeo and Juliet in that vein. And it even has ancient connotations of Greek mythology. We won't get into that. But basically, the nightingale is a symbol or image of the night as well as forbidden lovers. Romeo's response. It was the lark, the herald of the morn, no nightingale. So here, while Julia says it was the nightingale singing, the symbol of the night, Romeo says no, it was the lark. And the lark is the symbol of the morning, because both of these birds, the nightingale sings at night, the lark sings in the morning. So this is an indication that it's time for Romeo to leave. But keep going. No nightingale. Look, love, what envious streaks do lace the severe clouds in yonder east. Night's candles are burnt out, and jock and day stands tiptoe on the misty mountain tops. I must be gone and live, or stay and die. So this is both a tragic and pathetic moment for Romeo and Juliet. Of course, we don't approve of their rushed marriage, but still they are a married couple, married sacramentally in the church, as questionable as that can be since it was a secret marriage. The fact remains, they are an established, fully consummated, married couple, and now they are forbidden to see one another. So the choice is, Romeo can stay and die when he's found out, or he can leave to Mantua and hopefully stay with the friar, or have the friar's plan unfold. Let's see how they react. Turn to line 35. Right. The parts we're skipping, Romeo and Juliet are just talking about how Romeo doesn't want to go, they want to stay together, of course, blah, 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 all that stuff we've seen before. But now, it's at the point of frustration and anger, right? Juliet is so upset and distraught by the absence of her new husband. And so she says on line 35, 
Oh, now be gone. More light and light it grows. Romeo responds and says, More light and light, more dark and dark, our woes. So together they have this rhyming couplet, grows and woes. Why am I drawing your attention to this? Earlier on in the play, I asked you to pay attention and track a certain metaphor. And that metaphor or symbol was light and darkness. Again, I want to draw your attention to how we saw Romeo at the very beginning of the play, sitting under a tree at night, and then when daytime comes, he retreats into his house and shuns the light. Well, in a sense, the same thing is happening here. Even though it's light, Romeo has to go into it. With the rising of the sun, Romeo is associating himself and Juliet now with the darkness. They are together in dark at night and in secret. And then when light comes to reveal the truth of things, he vanishes and leaves to Mantua. So the metaphor I've talked to you guys about, and I hope you guys are following along, is that Romeo and Juliet's love shuns the light. Right? And then if you think of the symbolism of light, light is truth, it's holy, it's revealing, right? We say God is the light, the way, the truth, and the life. So light, life, truth are all associated with one another, whereas darkness represents evil deeds, secret deeds, and they prefer to be in the night rather than the darkness. Their love shuns light, shuns truth, shuns goodness, and they stay in that darkness. So keep track of this metaphor as we go. All right, jump with me to line 54, act three, scene five, line 54. There's a, a very interesting image we get here. As we've seen before, Romeo and Juliet take forever to say goodbye to one another. And on line 54, to set the scene a little bit, here's what Juliet is looking at. Romeo is climbing a ladder outside or down from Juliet's bedchamber, right into her garden. So Juliet, from her window, is looking down and seeing Romeo descending. All right, that's the setting, that's the image she sees. What does she say here on line 54 as she looks and watches Romeo leave from her window? She says, Oh God, I have an ill divining soul. And ill divining here it means foreseeing the future and it's bad. I have an ill divining soul. Methinks I see thee, now thou art below, as one dead in the bottom of a tomb. Either my eyesight, eyesight fails or thou lookest pale. So the image she sees as Romeo descending from her window into the garden is actually an image, a premonition of Romeo descending into a tomb, right? She's foreseen Romeo's death. And of course, since we know the play from the very beginning, we know that this is foreshadowing, right? R Shakespeare's gonna give us plenty of moments of foreshadowing throughout the next few scenes. But this is a premonition of Romeo, again, descending into the tomb as he descends down the ladder. So ever since Romeo and Juliet have been married, we're going to see how Shakespeare's pointing closer and closer to their death as this happens. So Romeo responds, and trust me, love, in my eye, so do you. You look pale. You look like death. As they depart, it's as if they're seeing the coming death of one another. Right? Think of this compared to Romeo entering the Capulet's party. Right? Remember how he talks about that he had a premonition that this night at this party, his heart would beat his last. Right? So there's this interesting premonition and foresight that these characters have, yet they act upon their impulses despite knowing something bad is going to come. Right? This is just imprudent, bad decisions. But it's interesting, again, just to emphasize, that they have premonitions of each other's deaths in addition to, as we've seen, their willingness and desire to die rather than to be separated from one another. So Shakespeare's building this up, up to the climactic moment at the end of the play. All right, let's keep moving forward here. Turn a little bit further in the play to Act 3, Scene 5. I want us to jump to line 92. What's going on here? After Romeo leaves Juliet's bedchamber, the nurse enters in and Juliet's ma mother, Lady Capulet, enters in. Now this is unusual. The noble families 
mom and daughter, we've seen they don't have a very close relationship. Really, Julia and the nurse have a closer relationship than Juliet's mother. So the fact that Juliet's mom enters into her bedchamber to speak with her early in the morning is a, is a sign that something unusual is happening here. Well, what is Lady Capulet going to tell her? We know from previous scenes who wants to, ex who wants to marry Juliet? Paris. And Paris has spoken with Capulet and they've arranged for a quick marriage within two days on Thursday. So this is the news Lady Capulet is going to bring to Juliet. So what happens? Let's set the scene from what we missed. Lady Capulet enters in and she sees that Juliet has been weeping, crying. Now we know that she is crying for Romeo because they just spent their last and first night together and she's crying because Romeo's banished. What does Lady Capulet think? She doesn't know about the wedding. She doesn't know about the love affair between Juliet and Romeo. She thinks that Juliet is weeping for Tybalt, her cousin who just died by the hands of Romeo. So the section of, of, the section of their dialogue we're gonna read between Lady Capulet and Juliet beginning on line 92 is this very interesting dialogue full of irony, right? Specifically dramatic irony. So I want you guys to follow this and of course add this to your literary term sheet. We're gonna talk about the dramatic irony that's happening. So read with me line 92. Again, Juliet is weeping. Lady Capulet thinks it's for her cousin Tybalt. And so Lady Capulet says to Juliet, we will have vengeance for it, meaning vengeance for the death of Tybalt. Fear thou not. Then weep no more. I'll send to one in Mantua, where that same banished runagate doth live. Shall give him such an unaccustomed dram, then he shall soon keep Tybalt company. And then I hope thou wilt be satisfied. Okay, what is Lady Capulet telling Juliet? She thinks that Juliet, again, is so distressed over, Capulet, or over Tybalt's death that now Lady Capulet's trying to comfort Juliet, saying, I'll send someone to Mantua, where Romeo's banished, and I'll have Romeo drink a dram, or poison. I'll have somebody essentially poison Romeo to kill him to avenge the death of Tybalt. Well, let's look at the foreshadowing that's happening here. Of course, Romeo's in Mantua, and now she's saying that Romeo is going to die by drinking a vial of poison. Think back to the prologue. Two lovers doth take their own lives, right? We're told from the very beginning that Romeo and Juliet will take their own lives. And now we have Shakespeare through the words of Lady Capulet saying that Romeo is going to drink poison. This is foreshadowing. We should be expecting to see this later on in the play at that climactic moment. Shakespeare's giving us the clues to what he's going to do at the end of the play. Well, how is Juliet going to take this? Not only is Romeo banished, but now her own mother is creating a plot to kill Romeo, to kill her husband. But Juliet can't express that right now. She can't reveal that. Who knows what would happen to her? So Juliet plays along, and this is where the dramatic irony really comes in. Juliet is, she's sharp, she's witty. So she's going to ex almost agree with what her mother is saying, but everything she says is going to have another connotation, right? So this is going to be an example of not only dramatic irony, because we know that Juliet's actually married, but also verbal irony, because Juliet is saying things that she doesn't really mean, or rather she means the opposite. So what does Juliet say? She says, Indeed, I never shall be satisfied with Romeo till I behold him. Okay, well, that's true right there. She's not going to be happy until she's reunited with Romeo. But she can't admit that. So she says, I'll never be satisfied with Romeo till I behold him. And then there's a dash. Dead. Right? Squeezing that in there so her mom won't be suspicious. Is my poor heart so for a kinsman vexed? Madame, speaking to her mother, if you could find out but a man to bear a poison, I would temper it that Romeo should, upon receipt thereof, soon sleep in quiet. Okay, what is she saying here? What does it mean to temper poison? Right, if she's saying, if you can find a man to give Romeo poison, I would weaken the poison. 
so that he would fall asleep and be affected by it, but wouldn't die. Why? Shouldn't this make Lady Capulet suspicious? No, because see what Juliet says next. Oh, how my heart abhors to hear him named. How my heart hates to hear Romeo named. Well, on one sense, it's because I hate Romeo. But on, this, on another sense, she hates to hear Romeo's name because she can't be with him. But then she goes further. Oh, how my heart abhors to hear him name and cannot come to him. Look at what she's admitting to her mom. I hate to hear him named and I hate that I can't go to Romeo. But her mom doesn't become suspicious because she's, Juliet says, to wreak the love I bore my cousin Tybalt upon his body that hath slaughtered him. All right, this is what Juliet is saying. If you are going to send a man to poison Romeo, I would weaken the poison so Romeo would be basically paralyzed, but not dead. In the sense that her mom, Lady Capulet, takes it, it seems as if Juliet is saying, because I want to go and kill Romeo myself because of how much I loved Tybalt. Right? This is where she says, to wreak the love I bore my cousin Tybalt upon his body that hath slaughtered him. So in the first sense, Juliet is saying, because I loved Tybalt so much, I'm going to put all that love into vengeance and kill Romeo. But underneath, as the audience knows her true feelings, what she's actually saying is, the love I have for my cousin Tybalt is less than what I have for Romeo. And all the love I should have for my cousin that would lead me to vengeance has actually been turned into love for Romeo. Right, so Julia is very clever here with this dialogue, pretending that she hates Romeo and wants vengeance, while at the same time expressing how much she loves Romeo. And her mother does not guess this at all because she doesn't know what happened like we do. So a great example of Shakespeare using both dramatic and verbal irony here. Okay, but the mom didn't come here to talk about Tybalt. Lady Capulet came to talk about something else. So turn, act three, scene five, line 117. <laughs> After this almost banter about killing Romeo, Lady Capulet tells Juliet, essentially, don't cry, don't weep anymore, for from now on, you are going to be happy. And she's trying to give Juliet some good news. Line 117, this is the good news Juliet gets. Lady Capulet says, Mary, my child, early next Thursday morn, the gallant young and noble gentleman, the county Paris at St. Peter's Church, shall happily make thee there a joyful bride. The good news is that, hey Juliet, in two days, you are going to marry Paris, a man you've already said you don't want to marry, you're not interested in him, we're going to make you do it anyway. That's the good news there. Juliet comes right back at her mom and says, now by St. Peter's Church and Peter too, he shall not make me there a joyful bride. All right, so she's saying, what? No, I cannot get married. I will not marry Paris. But pay attention to these next lines, and I'll have you underline these next two lines by Juliet. I wonder at this haste that I must wed ere he that should be husband comes to woo. What is she saying here? I wonder at this haste. Haste is rushed. Remember, it's Monday. Thursday, or rather Tuesday morning now, it's Tuesday, and they're getting married Thursday, within two days' time. So Juliet rightfully says, I wonder, I'm curious as to why you're rushing this so quickly. You've already arranged a marriage before I've even spoken with Paris, before he's even come to woo me, right? This is language she used with Romeo. And this is another example of irony. The irony here is that Juliet is saying, why are you rushing this marriage? Paris has not made a formal courtship. He has not made me fall in love with him and I'm being forced to marry him. In one sense, yeah, good for Juliet for calling out her parents. But isn't this exactly what she did with Romeo? They met one night. She said, I'm going to make you woo me. We need to slow down. So instead of doing something tonight, let's get married tomorrow. All right, so there's irony. She doesn't like when it happens with Paris, yet she did the same thing even quicker 
with Romeo. The difference here is that her parents are the ones forcing her into this. So let's keep reading here. I pray you, tell my lord and father, madam, I will not marry yet. And when I do, I swear it shall be Romeo, whom you know I hate rather than Paris. Another example of Juliet's sharp wit and the irony she's putting into this. She's saying, I will not marry yet. One, that's a lie. She's already married. And when I do, this is where, again, lie and truth at the same time. I swear it shall be Romeo, whom you know I hate. So what is she saying here? She's saying to her mom, seemingly, I would rather Romeo, I would rather marry Romeo, my sworn enemy, whom I hate, than rather marry Paris. So the way her mother hears this is, wow, she really doesn't want to marry Paris if she would rather marry the guy who killed her her cousin. But again, the irony is that we know she's already in love and already married to Romeo. She comes out and says it, but because her parents are not aware of it, they don't suspect anything. Right? So another brilliant use of irony on Shakespeare and Juliet's part. So after the mom, Lady Capulet, has given her this good news, her father Capulet comes in. Now, some interesting things happen with this dialogue between Capulet and Juliet. Capulet comes in and expects to be met with gratitude and thankfulness that he has arranged such a noble gentleman to marry his only daughter. He doesn't suspect that Juliet disapproves of this and does not want to go along with it. So he comes in thinking that this is going to be a great celebration, she's going to be so thankful, and then he's met with the complete opposite. Juliet does not want to play along. So, as Capulet enters in, Lady Capulet decides to say, Julia doesn't want to play. Does, Julia doesn't want to have anything to do with it. Look at line 145. Another example of foreshadowing here. Lady Capulet says, I, sir, but she will none. She gives you thanks. She will none, meaning she won't have any of this plan. She doesn't want to marry Paris. I would the fool were married to her grave. This is what Lady Capulet, both Juliet's mom and dad, Lord and Lady Capulet, think that this is a great honor they're giving her daughter. And when Juliet rejects it, they can't be more upset, more angry with her for rejecting their offer. And so Lady Capulet, in her anger at this, says, I would the fool were married to her grave, meaning I'd rather Juliet would die than disobey us and not marry Paris. Oh, how ironic her words are. Because, of course, we as the audience know that this is exactly what's going to happen. So this is another example of irony as well as foreshadowing. Right? What's this say about her parents? Think about Juliet's actions. She rushed into the, par into the marriage with Paris. Just like her parents are rushing her in... Let me backtrack. I think I misspoke. She rushed into her Juliet rushed into her marriage with Romeo just like her parents are rushing her into the marriage with Paris. Juliet would rather die than be separated from Romeo, just like her mother would rather she choose death than not marry Paris. It's no wonder Juliet acts the way she does. She learned it from her parents, who act just as poorly and make just the same bad decisions that she does. In one, on one hand, Juliet is fully responsible for her actions with Romeo and will bear the consequences. On the other hand, Juliet's parents taught her no differently, and they too, we should expect, to receive the consequence of their actions. So that's what Lady Capulet tells her. Now, what does her father say? What does Capulet say? Turn to Act 3, Scene 5. We're going to jump to line 164. Capulet is angry and upset at this. Not only has he already arranged the marriage with Paris, but it's two days from now. I mean, he's already started the preparations. And as a father, he is demanding obedience from his daughter. Now, of course, this is completely unjust because this is a request a father should not make on his 13-year-old daughter. Especially when in Act 1, when Paris first offered the idea of marriage, what did Juliet's father say? Oh no, she's too young. We don't want to risk her health by having a child too young. We don't want to push her into a marriage. 
Yet now in Act 3, he's doing the exact thing he didn't want to do. How hypocritical he is. And unjust he is. So he's forcing Julia into this marriage, basically saying, you will obey me. You will marry Paris. And at this point, he rejects any rationality. Julia is trying to plead with her father to abandon this idea of marrying Paris, especially within two days. I mean, at this point, she just wants to delay the wedding to figure out a plan on how to get out of it and how to be with Romeo. And her father won't hear any of it. So let's, let's hear what happens here. In line 164, Juliet is begging her father to listen to her, to just listen to anything and let her explain herself. She says, Good father, I beseech you on my knees. Hear me with patience, but to speak a word. Right. So as Capulet forces the marriage on Juliet, Juliet's trying to resist, trying to explain, but Lord Capulet won't even let his daughter speak. He won't listen to her. And Capulet, in rage and anger, says, Hang thee, you baggage, disobedient wretch. I'll tell thee what. Get thee to a church on, to church a Thursday, or never after look me in the face. Right? Ooh, harsh words. He calls his daughter a wretch for not listening to him, for not wanting this marriage at 13 years old. Right? This is very a very violent reaction from a father. And we can imagine this if we're watching the play. Juliet literally on her knees begging her father, and her father just dismissing her totally in rage. As she continues to beg and plead, maybe even falling at his feet, who knows, be dramatic with it. He says, speak not, reply not, do not answer me, my fingers itch. Right? He's so angry, he's ready to strike Juliet. And then he turns to his wife and says, Wife, we scarce thought us blessed, that God had lent us but this only child. But now I see this one is one too much, and that we have a curse in having her out on her. Or, and that we have a curse in having her, out on her hiding. Okay, a few things I want to point out here. Immediately, we can see the rage and anger of Lord Capulet. Again, unjustly so. He doesn't even allow Juliet to speak. And in really, in a sense, forcing her to take drastic me measures. Right? How can Juliet get out of this? If her father won't listen to her, Juliet is going to resort to some very desperate actions here and we're going to see what those actions are but i want to draw your attention really to a close reading of what capulet says about juliet he says we thought we were blessed that god gave us this child remember the rest of their children died as infants and juliet is their only surviving child so for a long time they thought that Ju juliet was their own blessing but then he turns on that and says, but now I see that this one is too much and that we have a curse in having her. Right, I wanna really show you how deep and how consequential these words are. Capulet invokes God himself, saying that we thought God had blessed us with this child, but now he looks upon Juliet, who understandably refuses to marry Paris. And he looks at her and says, God has cursed us with you. You are not a blessing, but your disobedience is a curse. Think of how dark this is. God gives them a blessing of their child, right? A child is the most innocent, pure thing on the face of the earth. And a parent's responsibility is to love and care for that child. And now Lord Capulet sees his own daughter as a curse. What he's actually doing is in his anger with Juliet is he is rejecting the gifts, mercy, and blessing of God. And in a sense, because of this, he is rejecting God himself. We could make a very interesting comparison here of Capulet, Lord Capulet, and Romeo. Haven't we seen these actions before? With Romeo rejecting the things of God, making an idol out of Juliet, right? Like we saw with Romeo's conversation with the friar, with Friar Lawrence. Friar Lawrence, after Romeo's banishment, tries to comfort him and says, No, you are, you're, you're banished. You're not going to be executed. 
God has given you a great mercy by letting you keep your life. And Romeo rejects it and says, I'd rather be dead. He rejects the mercy of the prince, rejecting the mercy of God. Just like Lord Capulet rejects Juliet as a blessing and sees her as a curse. In that way, both Lord Capulet and Romeo have the same fault. They reject the gifts of God and therefore reject God himself. That's how dark some of these actions are in this play. So, with that, the tension rises. The characters are hateful and angry and vengeful. But let's look at Juliet's problem now. She has a secret marriage with Romeo, her sworn enemy. He's been banished. And now she's been forced into a marriage with Paris. Let's talk about this marriage with Paris. One, she doesn't want it. She's 13 years old, understandably so. But two, she's already married in the church. The church does not allow multiple marriages. This would be the sin of adultery and a betrayal of her love for Romeo. So what is she to do? Rationally, she should come clean and say what happened and accept the consequences of that. But she doesn't. Why? Well, let's look exactly what those consequences are. We've seen the vi violent rage of Lord Capulet. And if you turn to line 204, we see it even more, we see it even stronger. Julia is still trying to plead with her father to delay the marriage at least. And Lord Capulet on line 204 says, And you be not, hang, beg, starve, die in the streets. For by my soul I'll ne'er acknowledge thee, nor what is mine shall never do thee good. Trust to it, bethink you, I'll not be forsworn. What he's saying to Juliet here is, if you don't obey me and marry Paris in two days' time, I would rather you be, I, I'm going to disown you and put you in the streets where you will starve. You will beg and die. How violent is this for a father to reject his own child, right? And this is why it's, it's not a stretch to think that he's rejecting even God himself because, of course, Juliet is a blessing from God. A child is always a blessing. And he's rejecting, renouncing that gift and that blessing for her to hang and die in the streets. How violent. How sad. Right? This is where Shakespeare, as a master playwright, is forcing the audience to, even though they disagree with Juliet's choices and we should judge her actions as wrong because she's acting by her passions, we should still have sympathy for Juliet. Right? No father should treat their thir his 13-year-old daughter this violently. Right? And so as everyone leaves, or as Lord Capulet leaves in his anger, this is his final word. If you don't obey me, I will disown you for good. And Juliet says, Is there no pity sitting in the clouds that sees into the bottom of my grief? And now she turns to her mother. O oh, sweet mother, cast me not away. Delay this marriage for a month, a week, or if you do not, make the bridal bed in that dim monument where Tybalt lies. Right, Juliet, having no sympathy from her father, turns to her mother and says, are you going to cast me out too? Pleading with her to delay this marriage and says, if you don't delay this marriage, make my bridal bed in that dim monument where Tybalt lies. Where's Tybalt? He's in a tomb. So again, this is a foreshadowing that Juliet would rather die, would rather take her own life than marry Paris. And she looks to her mother, and at this moment where her mother should turn to her with sympathy and understanding, says, Talk not to me, for I'll not speak a word. Do as thou wilt, for I have done with thee. As Juliet expresses that she would rather die and take her own life, Juliet's mom says, do what you want, I'm done with you. How cold, violent, and heartless this is. How tragic. So even though, again, the audience does not agree with Romeo and Juliet's choices, there's a human reaction here. 
right? We can't help but feel sympathy for them. No matter what Juliet has done with Romeo, no child at 13 years old should be forced into this marriage and have this violent of a reaction from her parents to disown her and would rather her die than disobey them. And that is a cause for sympathy with Juliet, which is why she's such a tragic character. Keep in mind, she's only 13. This is a child. She is too young to be dealing with these choices. Part of them are her own fault, but part are the direct responsibility of the parents. Right? Everyone's at fault in this. So as Juliet's mom leaves, Juliet is left with the nurse. And if we keep reading, Juliet says, Oh God, oh nurse, how shall this be prevented? So Juliet's been rejected by her father, rejected by her mother, and now turns to the nurse, who is really, who has the closest relationship with her. And Juliet says, My husband in, is on earth, my faith in heaven. How shall that faith return again to earth, unless that husband send it, from, send it me from heaven? It's easy to pass over these lines here, and I'm not going to. You know I won't. Look at what she says. My husband is on earth, my faith in heaven. She doesn't say her faith is on earth. Julia doesn't say that she herself has faith. She only says that she, that her husband is on earth and her faith is in heaven. In one sense, it could seem like she's saying that her faith is in God who is in heaven, but the next line doesn't allow us to believe that because she says, how shall my faith return to me unless my husband send it to me? Right, so what she's actually saying is she has abandoned faith in God and has only put her faith in Romeo. And the only way she will, she will regain her faith is if Romeo comes back. Again, continuing this image, this metaphor, that Romeo has become her God. Right, she's abandoned faith in God, rejected God, and put her faith and trust in Romeo. And in part, this is what leads to their tragedy. By abandoning faith in God and choosing your own will will only result in tragedy and destruction. This is what we learn from Romeo and Juliet. So let's keep reading. She ta Juliet talks to the nurse and says, Comfort me, counsel me. Alack, alack, that heaven should practice stratagems upon so soft a subject as myself. Right? She, the reason, one of the reasons she rejects God is because she thinks God is just punishing her and toying with her and torturing her, which of course is not the case. These are the, this situation is the result of her own parents' free will and bad decisions as well as her own. And she begs the nurse to comfort her. What sayest thou? Hast thou not a word of joy? Some comfort nurse. She asks for a word of comfort. She confides in the nurse, and the nurse is supposed to give her advice. But what does the nurse tell her? The nurse says, we're going to skip a few lines here in the nurse's little monologue. I think it best you married with the county, with Paris. And she tries to make it lie and says, oh, he's a lovely gentleman. Romeo's a dishclout, a dishcloth, a rag compared to Paris. Look at the advice the nurse gives her. The nurse was the one who helped set up the marriage to Romeo in the church, right? We're supposed to see this as a sacramental marriage, even though it's done in secret. And the nurse herself is saying, you know what? Forget Romeo. Commit adultery and marry Paris. This is, again, another adult who is supposed to be a counselor and wise, abandoning truth and goodness for what's easy and informing Juliet to just go ahead and marry Paris. This is dangerous. This is wrong. And this can, again, only lead to destruction. So, unsatisfied with this, Juliet decides to go see Friar Lawrence directly and have him help with the problem. Right? Juliet is running out of people she can turn to. Abandoned by her father and mother, betrayed by the nurse, and now the only person she knows to turn to is Friar Lawrence. But before we finish out this scene, Let's turn to line 248. This is Juliet's soliloquy. So soliloquy starting on line 248. Make sure to add that to your terms, please. Upset by the 
wrong counsel, the wrong advice the nurse gives her. Julia, in anger and by herself, exclaims, curses the nurse, saying, ancient damnation, O most wicked fiend. Is it more sin to wish me thus forsworn, or to dispraise my lord with that same tongue which she had praised him with, with above compare so many thousand times? Right. Despite being 13, and despite rushing to a marriage, Juliet understands to some degree what a marriage bond is. She says, it is sinful to wish that I abandon my marriage to Romeo and marry another. It is a sin to break my marriage vow, right? And of course she's right. This is the sin of adultery, right? Something that is explicitly condemned uh, in scripture and in, of course, Roman and Juliet are Catholics in the Catholic Church. So with this, the stakes are high, she says. So many thousand times, go, counselor, right? She's telling the nurse, like, I don't even want to hear this anymore. Thou and my bosom henceforth shall be twain. I'll to the friar to know his remedy. If all else fail, myself have power to die. What are the final lines in this uh, little soliloquy? I'll tell to the friar to know his remedy. If all else fail, myself have power to die. She's going to go to Friar Lawrence and seek out a solution to this problem. But the last line, she says, but if he fails in a solution, I would rather die. And I have it within my power to take my own life. Do you see how many times already in Act 3, Shakespeare has foreshadowed their death? Over and over again, the desire to take one's life rather than be separated from each other. And this is where we sit with Act 3, okay? <laughs> The problem is here. How is Julia going to get out of this marriage with Paris and be united with Romeo? The stakes are high, right? Either she admits to her secret marriage with Romeo, which is a violation of her loyalty to her family and also a secret marriage, or she can commit adultery and marry Paris, which is equally as bad in her eyes. So she goes to Friar Lawrence and this is where we open with act four. Now we're gonna go a little bit further into act four to start. We're gonna start on act four, scene one, line 51. The conversation between Friar Lawrence and Juliet. So just to set up the scene before we start reading, Juliet, distressed and figuring out how to deal with this problem, goes to Friar Lawrence. And when she gets there, who does she find but Paris setting up the marriage with Friar Lawrence. Now again, Friar Lawrence is the only other person, besides the nurse and Romeo and Juliet themselves, that know of this marriage. And Paris has just come to the Friar Lawrence saying, hey, we're setting up a wedding for Thursday. Be ready. Who are you marrying? Juliet. Uh-oh. Big problem for Fri Friar Lawrence. He's a priest. He knows he can't marry Juliet because she's already married to Romeo. He's the one who performed that. So this problem is shared not just by Juliet, but by Friar Lawrence himself. And so when Juliet comes, he, they talk about the solution to this problem. There's an interesting exchange here, again, just showing Juliet's wit. We're not gonna read it, but Paris basically saying, oh, Juliet, good, good that you're here. We're gonna set up our wedding. And Juliet has some snarky remarks, and I hope you, you can find those when you read this. But anyway, Juliet pretends to go to confession with Friar Lawrence, but really seeks out a, a solution to this problem. So, beginning on line 51, this is a private conversation between Friar Lawrence and Juliet. Juliet says, Tell me not, Friar, that thou hearest of this, unless thou tell me how I may prevent it. So she's basically saying, Don't tell me how bad this problem is. I know. Just give me a solution to this problem. If in thy wisdom thou canst give no help, do thou but call my resolution wise, and with this knife I'll help it presently. God joined my heart and Romeo's, thou our hands, and ere this hand by thee to Romeo's sealed shall be the label to another deed. I really want you guys to think of what Juliet's feeling right now. Right? Of course we don't agree with her actions, but that doesn't change the fact that she has been forced into this impossible situation. She cannot turn to her parents or the nurse, and so in her mind she's trapped, and she's forced to deal with this herself. 
And so she goes to the friar and says, Look, you need to help me figure out this problem. And she's so desperate, she's brought along a knife with her, a dagger, and says, if you can't help me with this knife, I will help the problem. That's how desperate Juliet is to get out of this. Think about how the friar sees this. He knows how bad this problem is, and now a 13-year-old girl has come to him for help, so distressed and desperate, she's brought a knife to take her own life. Right? This is another very human experience for the friar. It's easy for us to kind of step back a little bit and say, okay, this is what should happen. Uh, this was where Julia went wrong. We can criticize her all day long. But if we allow ourselves to enter into the action of the play, we might have a little more sympathy for these characters. And in particular here, the friar. Juliet's come to him and says, if you don't help me figure this out, I will take my own life. I mean, you can't react to that rationally immediately. Your judgment is clouded by your emotion and your sensitivity and your care, right? All of these reactions are understandable. So the friar is going to do his best to come up with a solution, but just let's read a little more to just really put ourselves in the position of Juliet and the friar. So continuing on with Juliet's monologue. Or my true heart with treacherous revolt turn to another, this shall slay them both. Basically she's saying, if I turn and marry Paris, Romeo's not gonna take that and you, he, he might take his own life the, just like I will. Therefore, out of thy long experienced time, give me some present counsel, right? You're a friar, you're a priest, you're wise. Help me, or behold, twixt my extremes, and me this bloody knife shall play the umpire, arbitrating that which the commission of thy years and art could, no, could to no issue of true honor bring. Again, really emphasizing, saying, if you can't figure this out, this knife will. I will take my own life. Right? Foreshad I don't even know if at this point you can call it foreshadowing because Shakespeare's coming right out and telling you what's going to happen to Juliet, what she's going to do, right? From the prologue, we know it doesn't work out. We know that they take their own lives. And now she's holding a dagger, already calling it bloody, right? This image, very, very potent. Um, so we could see this dagger even as a metaphor for the desperation of Juliet. And she finishes out, be not so long to speak, I long to die, if what thou speakest not of remedy. I, I, we've touched on this enough. How does Friar Lawrence respond? Hold, daughter, right? Of course, good human reaction. Wait a minute, slow down. Let's think about this. I do spy a kind of hope, which craves as desperate an execution as that is desperate which we would prevent. Okay. What is he saying? Hey, okay, stop. He comes up with the first thing on his head. Again, a 13-year-old desperate girl comes to him and says, I need help. I need it now. If you don't, I'll take my own life. We can't expect him to be thinking so rationally that he comes up with a perfect solution. He comes up with the first thing he can think of and says, okay, here's your hope. Here's the solution. Just whatever you do, don't commit this action of desperation. Right, so he basically says, look, I've got a plan. It's crazy enough, it might work. And if you're crazy, not crazy enough, if you're desperate enough to take your own life, then let's try this first, okay? If rather than to marry County Paris, thou hast the strength and will to slay thyself, then it is likely thou wilt undertake a thing like death to chide away this shame that copest with death himself to escape from it. Okay, he's speaking a little strangely here. He's saying, if you're desperate enough to take your own life, are you, you, you're you more than desperate enough to try something that's going to mimic death itself. And if thou darest, I'll give thee remedy. So he's saying, this is a desperate plan, but are you willing to try it? And of course, she's going to say yes to anything. Hop over to line 91. Okay, after Juliet agrees for, she basically says, I'll do anything as long as it reunites me with Romeo and gets me out of marrying Paris. The friar 
lays out his plan. So his monologue, literary term, monologue on line 91 is going to explain the plan. Hold then. Go home. Be merry. Give consent to marry Paris. Okay, he's saying go home. Be joyful. Right, don't act sad. And consent to marry Paris. Isn't this the same counsel the nurse gave Juliet? No. Keep reading. Wednesday is tomorrow. Okay, so now we're getting a timeline. Today is Tuesday. Wednesday is tomorrow. Thursday is the wedding. So they have one day. They have one day to make this plan work. Tomorrow night, look that thou lie alone. Let not the nurse lie with thee in thy chamber. He's saying tomorrow night, when you go to bed, be alone. Don't even let the nurse be in your chamber. You need to be alone. Take thou this vial, being then in bed, and thou this and this distilled liquor drink thou off. He gives her a potion, an elixir. It says, drink this when you go to bed tomorrow. So the day before the wedding, drink this. When presently thou all thy veins shall run a cold and drowsy humor, for no pulse shall keep his native progress, but surcease. No warmth, no breath shall testify thou livest. What is he saying? Drink this, and the blood in your veins will grow cold. Your pulse will seem to have stopped. Your skin will grow cold. There will be no warmth, and your breathing will be so soft it will be like you're not breathing. Basically, when you drink this, there will be no sign that you're alive. This potion is meant to put Juliet into a death-like state, basically a comatose state, but even more so, right? Now, of course, we can say, oh, a potion like this can't exist, and whatever. That's not the point. The point is, this vial, she'll drink it, and it'll look and appear as if she had died, right? So, kind of ironic here. She's wishing for death, and now she's going to take a potion that's going to mimic that death. Why? How else, what else is going to happen here? Jump down to line 111. He's, the friar says, once they, you know, they go to your chamber and say, all right, Julia, time to wake up for your wedding. They're going to see you and they're going to think you're dead. And then in line 111, he says, then, as the manner of our county is, in thy best robes uncovered on the bier, thou shalt be born to that same ancient vault where all the kindred of the Capulets lie. They're going to think you're dead. So what are they going to do? Well, they're going to dress you in a nice cloak, and they're going to bury you. This is the friar's plan. Take a vial before the wedding. The wet, On the wedding day, they're going to think you've died, so they'll take you and bury you, as is the custom of the land. So basically the law is you bury someone immediately, just like they did with Tybalt. Part 2. Shall Romeo... By my letters know our drift, and hither shall he come. And he and I will watch thy waking, and that very night shall Romeo bear thee hence to Mantua. Okay, let's look at this. Shall Romeo by my letters know our drift? And drift means purpose. Have you ever used the phrase, hey, catch my drift? You can thank Shakespeare for that. So, basically, the friar is going to write a letter to Romeo, letting him know of their plan so that Juliet can get out of the wedding. So Romeo is going to receive a letter, just to be clear. Romeo is going to receive a letter informing him of the plan. So that way, while Juliet's in the tomb, Romeo and the friar will sneak into the tomb. Romeo will take the lifeless body of Juliet, or rather they'll be there when she wakes up, and together they will run off to Mantua. So the plan is she's going to pretend to die, be buried, wake up, Romeo will be there, and they'll go to Mantua. What could possibly go wrong? Um, but keep reading a little further. How is Romeo going to get this letter? Because this, this is a crucial part to understanding the rest of the play. Juliet says, give me, give me. She's all on board. Friar Lawrence says, hold, get you gone. Be strong and prosperous in this resolve. I'll send a friar with speed to Mantua with my letters to thy lord. 
Okay, so Friar Lawrence is not going to be the one who gives Romeo the letter to explain the plan. Instead, he gives Juliet the vial, and then a, he's going to write the letter, and then another friar will send word to Romeo. So let's look at the moving parts here, okay? The wedding is on Thursday. Today is Tuesday. She has to drink the vial. They have to bury her in a tomb. On the other hand, Romeo has to get the letter, make sure he gets into Mantua unnoticed, enter into the Capulet's tombs unnoticed, and then somehow get Juliet out of Verona unnoticed to take her to Mantua. What could possibly go wrong? Okay, pop over. We're going to now go to Act 4, Scene 2. After we know the plan and Juliet has, is on board with the plan, she goes back home. Let's think of where she left off with her parents. She said, I'm not going to marry Paris, and they both essentially disowned her and kicked her to the streets unless she agrees to marry Paris. So, Act 4, Scene 2, Line 18. She goes back home, and now she's playing along with the plan. She says, there her parents see her and say, hey, where have you been? And they're kind of teasing her for being headstrong and arrogant and disobedient. And Juliet says, where I have learned me to repent the sin of disobedient opposition to you and your behests. Basically, I'm just coming back from confession, and I've learned I need to apologize for disobeying you. And I'm enjoined by Holy Lawrence to fall prostrate here, right? Saying, Friar Lawrence convinced me to be obedient. And of course, irony, right? Dramatic irony. That's not what's happening. To beg your pardon. Pardon, I beseech you. Henceforward, I am ever ruled by you. So Juliet apologizes, begs for forgiveness, and says, I'm all on board. Look at what Capulet says. Overjoyed that Juliet's now on board with marrying Parrish, he says, send for the county. Go tell him of this. I'll have this knot knit up tomorrow morning. I'll have this, right? You've heard the phrase, tie the knot. Thank Shakespeare. I'll have this knot knit up tomorrow morning. Wait a minute. What day is today? Today's Tuesday. That's what the friar told us. The wedding is Thursday. Well, now Capulet is saying, well, if you're on board, why wait? Let's have the wedding tomorrow on Wednesday. He's moving the wedding date up a day earlier, rushing the wedding again, just like Romeo and Juliet rushed the wedding. Juliet, here's how she responds. I met the youthful Lord at Lawrence's cell, right? I met Paris when I went to go see Friar Lawrence and gave him what become love I might not stepping or the bounds of modesty, basically saying, I already told Paris we're on board. Capulet. Why, I am glad on it. This is well. Stand up. This is as should be. Let me see the county. Ah, Mary, go, I say, and fetch him hither. Now, afore God, this reverend holy friar, all our whole city is much bound to him. Bound to him. So Capulet is praising Friar Lawrence for talking such sense into Juliet. Juliet. Plain along. Nurse, will you go with me into my closet to help me sort such needful ornaments as you think fit to furnish me tomorrow? Asking the nurse to help her pick something out for the wedding. Lady Capulet. No, not till Thursday. There is time enough. Okay, so here we see Lady Capulet saying, why rush? Thursday's quick enough. Let's just wait for Thursday for the wedding. But Capulet says, go nurse, go with her. Will to church tomorrow. Right? Capulet has, he's set on changing the wedding date to the very next day. Lady Capulet, we shall be short in our provision. Tis now near night. Right? Lady Capulet, concerned we don't have enough time to plan a wedding. Yeah, a day. <laughs> Capulet, tush, I will stir about and all things shall be well. I warrant thee, wife. Go thou to Juliet. Help to deck up her. I'll not to bed tonight. Let me alone. Blah, blah, blah. Basically saying... We're going to get married. They're going to get married tomorrow. Think of how this is going to play out with their plan. Friar Lawrence is sending a letter to Romeo that the wedding is on Thursday, and that's when he should come. But now, the wedding has been moved up a day. 
this throws the whole plan off, right? Romeo might not be there in time, right? We'll see what happens. But think back to the structure of the tragedy that we talked about last semester. Do you remember what peripatia is? Peripatia is that reversal of fortune, basically what you intend to happen, the exact opposite happens. Well, think, how is this going to be a reversal of fortune for the characters? Pop over to line 15. So, sorry, act four, scene three, line 15. Juliet has played the part of, you know, accepting this marriage to Paris and seemingly is unfazed by the change of date. It doesn't matter to her. She's playing along. But now she's in her chamber by herself. The nurse isn't there. The, her mom's not there. And now we get to see her true feelings and thoughts. So on line 15, we see Juliet's soliloquy, right? Literary term here. The nurse and her mother leave and she says, farewell, God knows when we shall meet again. I have a faint cold fear thrills through my veins. Let's hear the rhythm of this. Farewell, God knows when we shall meet again. I have a faint cold fear thrills through my veins. Think meter, I'll let you decide what that is. But she's feeling scared, right? A cold fear thrills my veins that almost freezes up the heat of life. I'll call them back again to comfort me. Nurse, what should she do here? My dismal scene I needs I must act alone. But she's getting married tomorrow. She doesn't know what to do. She's going to try to go along with the plan anyway. She says, come vial, right? She's going to drink the vial to put her into a death-like state today, tonight, one day earlier than the plan is meant to be. And now she starts expressing fears and doubt about all this. She says, what if this mixture do not work at all? Right? What if the mixture doesn't do what it's supposed to? Shall I be married then tomorrow? No, 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 no. this shall forbid it. So she's saying, no, 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 this will work, this will work. I'll be in that comatose. No, 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 this shall forbid it. Lie thou here. Here's what's going on. Before she drinks the vial, she's thinking of a backup plan. If the vial doesn't work and I wake up tomorrow morning for the wedding, how am I going to stop the wedding? And she still has her dagger and takes it out. Again, the foreshadowing here is so obvious. Right? She puts the dagger down. The alternative, if this doesn't work, like she said earlier, she has the power to take her own life. And then another fear happens. What if it be a poison which the friar suddenly, ha suddenly hath ministered to have me dead? Lest in this marriage he should be dishonored because he married me before to Romeo. Right? Again, she thinks, well, the friar already knows that I'm married to Romeo. He wouldn't knowingly marry me to Paris again. So what if to save his own skin, He's given me a poison that will kill me for real so he doesn't have to admit that he's already married me. Otherwise, he would put his own soul in mortal danger. But she casts that aside and says, Yet methinks it should not, for he hath still been tried a holy man. She sees the friar and still sees him as a holy man. Uh, and I think the friar is a very complicated character. Similar to how we should feel about Romeo and Juliet, right? We should not approve of the friar's actions, right? He marries Romeo and Juliet to try to bring peace to the families, right? This is an example of good motivation, bad idea, bad execution. Similarly, Juliet comes to him with a dagger and says, help me or I'm going to take my own life, right? This is puts him in a very difficult situation. And so he comes up with the first thing on his head. Well, okay, let's not have you marry Paris. Again, like his intention was to save Juliet and to somehow still bring peace to the families. Noble cause, bad execution, bad idea. Keep reading. How if, when I am laid into the tomb, I wake before the time that Romeo come to redeem me? This is Juliet's third concern. What if it works? They put me in the tomb. I wake up. And Romeo's not there. That's a fearful point. Shall I not then be stifled in the vault to whose foul mouth no healthsome air breathes in and there die strangled ere my Romeo comes? 
But again, this is a day before the plan. What if she wakes up in the tomb and Romeo's not there to rescue her? She's scared that she's going to suffocate to death in the tomb. Right? And Romeo's going to miss his chance. And then Romeo will come and she'll already be dead. Right? These are all the concerns running through her head. Now, we're not going to look at all of these. But these are very understandable concerns. right? These are very logical concerns. Basically saying so many things could go wrong with this plan. What does she ultimately resolve? Well, turn to the very last four lines of scene four. Right after she goes through even more concerns, fears, and doubts, right? She's going to go through with this anyway, knowingly, or knowing that this has moved up a day and the plan could go off. So she says, she thinks about her death. She thinks about being buried in the tomb and says, oh, look, methinks I see my cousin's ghost seeking out Romeo that did spit his body upon a rapier's point. Right? She's thinking of being buried in the tomb where Tybalt's buried. And she, it's like she feels the ghost of Tybalt. Uh, now, there's no ghost here. Sorry, that's Macbeth. You'll read that next year. But she feels like Tybalt is going to have his vengeance. Stay, Tybalt. Stay. Romeo, I come. I, this do I drink to thee. And she drinks the vial. And again, this vial will put her into a death-like state. So, this is where we, we leave off for today. What's happening? Well, Juliet has gone to the fry, to Friar Lawrence to come up with a plan, desperate enough to kill herself. To avoid that, the Friar gives her this vial that will put her into a death-like state, and she's hoping, praying, that Romeo will come and save her like the plan suggests. But the problem here is that the wedding is moved from Thursday to Wednesday. And it's already too late to go back to Friar Lawrence, and that would raise suspicions. So her hope is that she's going to drink the vial. Friar Lawrence will obviously find out the wedding's moved up because he's the one who is supposed to perform the wedding. And so she's trusting, without talking to Friar Lawrence, she's trusting that he will be able to send word to Romeo so the plan can still work out. This is risky, she's doubtful, she's fearful, she's scared, and of course, this is a 13-year-old trying to think through all of this. We leave scene four with a sense of sympathy for Juliet, not approving of her actions, but filled with both pity for her, we feel sorry for her, and fear, because we don't know what's going to happen. Well, we do, but she doesn't know. And so we feel the same fear that she does. All right, so please keep up with the reading. Please keep up with your literary terms chart. Uh, one announcement before I sign off. Um, we are getting close to the end of the play. We only have two more lessons on Romeo and Juliet. Um, since we are now online, we have to do things a little differently. So after the text, after the reading of the text, we should be expecting a test coming up, and I will be giving you more information on that next class or next video rather so please continue to read on your own it might be a good idea to start you know to study for the test to make sure you understand the not the play is little by little i'm going to ask you to do this is to create simple few sentences that summarize each act and scene so two to three sentences is a good way to study for this Two to three, write two to three sentences simply summarizing each act and scene. So act one has five scenes. That should be five summaries right there. And please use resources to help you. Again, No Fear Shakespeare, Spark Notes, they're pretty decent to understand the basic plot points of Romeo and Juliet, but don't rely on it to go in depth. And I will be asking you to give in depth analysis. Again, we're going to do this slowly. I'll give you more information uh, next video. So Stay healthy. Hope you enjoy this or appreciate it at the very least. All right. I'll see you soon.